we give glory to God. You can go. And we're grateful for this opportunity. We don't want her to catch a cold. <laughs> but we, this is something that we are invited to as a church to continue to invest in this journey, right? She's inviting us to be witnesses, but she's also inviting us into community and say, I have just made this public before you, that you may know who I am, that you may help me to continue to maintain that identity in Christ Jesus. So I encourage you that we will continue to build that relationship with Amy. Today we continue to talk about something that is different this time. What about my convictions? How many of you have convictions? Not like criminal conviction. We're talking about like something that I strongly believe in, right? We all do, and we all have um, opinions as well. How many of you have opinions? Okay, we all do. How many of you have strong opinions about certain things? Now more than ever, right? It's like, nah, <laughs> right? If anything, during this day and age, it seems like opinions and convictions are being confused. And there are way too many to just drive us nuts. And we just don't even want to even talk about when someone says, in my opinion, and all of a sudden we have a wall, <laughs> Okay, right? I just don't want to argue. I don't want, because we're tired of it, right? And so, or even when someone says, well, this is my conviction, and this is what I believe. And it's become hard. It's become challenging. And it's no news for us that these opinions haven't just come up today. They've been with us all these times. What's made it different is that now these opinions have many venues right, to make it validation and to prove their point. And we, unfortunately, have such easy access to all those opinions. And it makes it so overwhelming, and it makes it so hard. An opinion, right, it's basically this, a view, judgment, or appraisal form in the mind about a particular matter, right? So I can have an opinion about the Dodgers, and just how much work they need to do, right? Or I can have an opinion about the Don or the 49ers. I know we got 49ers fan, not to pick on you, and just how bad they are, right? But these are all what? These are all just simple opinions. They're not necessarily based on facts and knowledge, right? They're not necessarily based on facts and knowledge. And it's just opinions. These opinions are formed throughout our lifetime that are shaped by our context and those whom we associate most commonly. So if I am a sports fan and I grew up in a family that loves sports and one and one team only, right, and they have taught me to love that team, guess what? My opinion is going to be very different than someone who grows up in a different context who's never heard of baseball, right, who's never heard of that name, and all of a sudden you try and convince that person why baseball is such a wonderful sport. It's like, what? <laughs> I don't care. I've never heard of it. I don't want to know about it. Right? And it's hard, but not impossible, but hard to formulate a negative opinion about something you grew up loving, something that you were taught to love, and are surrounded by people that share that same love. It's very hard. Right? Likewise, it's very hard, not impossible, but hard to formulate a positive opinion about something you grew up disliking, were taught to dislike, and are surrounded by people that share that same dislike. And we can have just an array of topics about what that looks like. Even in my family, it's shameful, but <laughs> we all can relate. We were raised to love our national pride and dislike those who oppose us or who look different than us. We were shaped to like our tradition, to love our tradition, and make fun of those who don't share the same tradition. And those opinions can be shaped and reshaped and reshape throughout your life. Yet opinions can be changed, though. When fed with proper knowledge and information and experiences, and of course, the biggest part, when you're willing to listen 
and learn. When you're willing to listen and learn. It gets even more complicated, though, when we go from opinion to conviction. So opinion, it's, it feels light, right? But when you go from opinion to conviction, then we start hitting something deeper, right? And, and Paul shows that transition because he begins talking about opinions and then he goes to convictions. Let me tell you what a conviction is, right? Conviction is a firmly held belief or opinion. So it's not wishy-washy anymore. This is like, no, I strongly believe in this opinion. And I am right. It's no longer just an opinion. And it becomes so challenging to reshape that opinion or your conviction because here's the problem. It's tied to your identity. Convictions are so hard to change because we so easily are attached and tie our identity to that conviction. The Apostle Paul had a subtle way of dealing with this when people within the church clashed with opposing and controversial convictions as well. He starts as opinions and then moves on to convictions. This wasn't necessarily about two cultures or two different ethnic groups coming together. This was just the body of Christ coming with different ideas, different opinions, different convictions, right? And saying, yeah, I don't agree with you, hence I can't be with you. This was within the very body of Christ who had certain practices. And then when a practice is challenged, they say, but why? We've always done it this way. So here it is in Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 8. It's a scripture that we're going to look at today. And it says this, Welcome the person who is weak in faith, but not in order to argue about differences of opinions. One person believes in eating everything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Those who eat must not look down on the ones who don't, and the ones who don't eat must not judge the ones who do, because God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servants? They stand or fall before their own Lord, and they will stand because the Lord has the power to make them stand. One person considers some days to be more sacred than the others, while another person considers all days to be the same. Each person must have their own convictions. Someone who thinks that a day is sacred thinks that way for the Lord. Those who eat, eat for the Lord, because they thank God. And those who don't eat, don't eat for the Lord, and they thank the Lord too. We don't live for ourselves, and we don't die for ourselves. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we belong to who? To God. This is something so important that you have to understand. Paul is never telling you don't ever have opinions. Is he saying that? Paul is never saying don't ever have convictions. Paul accepts these differences of opinions and convictions, and he's not saying you guys should get rid of them so no one has any opinion and no one has any conviction. No, he says these are opinions and convictions that are going to come your way, and they're going to continue to come your way. But here's the attitude that you should take on as you are confronted and encounter differences of opinions and convictions. is don't judge them. Don't argue about it. They didn't come to see God. They didn't come to the body of Christ, right, to argue about opinions. They came to find what? They came to find community. He came to find God. But we make it about opinions and convictions when it's not the way it's supposed to be. So Paul wraps up this controversial uh, dynamic, right, by reminding us about something very important at the end. And it goes back to identity, right? He finishes thought by reminding us that we belong to who? We belong to God. And so I want you to repeat this with me. Say, I belong to God. I am loved by God. Just as I am, I belong to God. Now I want you to look to the person next to you or behind you. I assure you that that person next to you, even if it's your spouse sitting next to you, right, has differences of opinions and different convictions. He's like, nah, we've never argued about that. Yeah, right? So you laugh because it's true. But that same person that you just looked at had the same confession that you had. That person 
before you see his conviction or her conviction, before you saw his or her opinion, before you saw how different they are in ideas, right? The first thing that you should remember when you see that person is what he or she confessed. I am a child of God. I belong to God. I am loved by God. Just as I am, I belong to God. If we can see people like that first, before we see their convictions and their opinions and their looks and their accents and their clothing and whatever, right? If we can just begin to see first their identity, I, am, I belong to God. I am loved by God just as I am. I belong to God. We would solve a lot of issues, right? So the person who sits next to you shares that same identity, then Paul states the premise. Once an identity has been established, a common identity, right, that we're all cherished by God, loved by God, no matter how different we look or how different our opinions can be, he states the premise for these groups of people who hold differing opinions, right? It says, ultimately, the one who abstains from certain foods does it to honor who? God. So you can actually say, I don't want to eat, right? any meat, as it was the case here, right? Because I want to honor God by eating only this. Like, is that wrong? No, right? This is just their, that personal choice, right, of honoring God with how uh, they take care of their body. And if someone says, well, that is not a conviction of mine, well, that's fine. But can you still honor God with what's before you at the table, Right? It's the same thing with keeping the Sabbath, right? There was an issue also of keeping one day holy and the other person said, well, I want to keep every day holy, right? It's like, as long as you do it for God, honor it. And the question then becomes, who are we to judge someone else's servants? Is Paul's rhetorical question. In other words, what Paul is trying to tell you is, who are we to judge someone who belongs to God? The servant is talking about, right, us and the Lord being who? God. So if we all come here together and we all have the same Lord, the same God, right, who am I to, serve, who, to judge someone else's servants, right? So when I judge you, in other words, I'm trying to judge God and say, hey, God, look at your servant. You <laughs> kind of messed up with that guy, I think, right? How do you think God's going to take that? So God says, don't do that, right? Who are you? to judge someone else's servants. God says, these are my servants. Let me handle them. Let me take care of them. Let me love them. But just do as I do. Love them. Right? And whether we have a difference of opinions or convictions, my identity with God remains the same. Right? And yours as well. It shouldn't change. It doesn't have to change. And that identity in God, which is, again, from the very beginning, I belong to God. I am loved by God just as I am. I belong to God. That identity in God will never excuse me from this. Luke chapter 10, verse 27. Because of who I am, because I am a child of God, pay attention to this. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself it's as simple as that no matter how different you are from me love god and love your neighbor as yourself no matter how adamant you can be about your own convictions love god and love your neighbor as yourself because i am a child of god i can walk and share the love of god with those who are different than me because i am a child of god and i belong to god i can show compassion towards others who are different than me. I can walk humbly together with those who are different than me. I can show mercy towards others who are different than me. I can walk righteously with others who are different than me because I am a child of God. Right? Part of our mission here at the Foundry is to embody this, to learn to embrace all people. To not let our differences mar our identity as children of God. To not let our differences be an excuse to not obey God's command to love one another. It never stood in the way of Jesus when he gave his life for those who not only held different convictions but 
straight out opposed him and wanted him dead. He continued to display his love. Our personal convictions don't have to define who we are. And that's where it becomes really hard. When we, when we do build our identity around our personal convictions, guess what happens? We quickly get offended and hurt when it's challenged, criticized, or opposed. When we build, I'm going to repeat that again because it's so easy for us to do it. When we build our identity around our personal convictions, we quickly get offended and hurt when it's challenged, criticized, or opposed. Because we're not building it on who we are as God sees us. We're just building it on our own personal convictions. So when someone comes with something different, we quickly get hurt. When we do build our identity around our personal convictions, it becomes easier to judge those who are not on the same page as you are. No, they're way too different. And we judge them immediately. When we do build our identity around our personal convictions, guess what? We also become more exclusive rather than inclusive. So we don't build our identity on our convictions, on opinions. We build it on God. And it is my relationship with God that allows me to see beyond and above all those convictions and opinions and say, but I see you. I see you're a child of God. I see you're a person created in the image of God. I see that you're someone who's loved by God, who's cherished by God, just as you are. Hence, because I am that person too, I shall love you and love my neighbor as myself. It goes something like this. I can speak love towards others even when contradicted because my father loves me, not my convictions. Your father, our father doesn't say, I love your convictions. I love your opinions. No, he'll never say that. He'll say, I love you. Right? I can speak love to myself even when I fail because my father loves me, not my success. He loves me. I can speak love because my father speaks love to me every day. Every day. It's hard for me to think that for someone who spends time with God daily, right, and I know you've had this experience. You say you've just had this wonderful hour with God where you were just basked in his love, right? And you just come out so rejuvenated and filled, right? It's so hard when you have heard God speak love to you for that past hour to immediately turn around and speak hate towards your brother, right? It's just there's something that doesn't match. Because we've just been hearing how much God loves you and how much he cherishes you. And it's hard for our spirit to turn around 180 degrees and the first person that we see have hatred towards that person. And that's why it's so essential for us to spend time with God, to hear what God has to say. Because what God has to say is just love every day, how much he loves you how much he loves you. And when we're basked in that, it's hard. It becomes harder, right, for us to turn around and hate others or dislike others. Church, you don't know how proud I am of you all because the diversity that exists here today in our midst, it's not just the work of one person. It's not just the work of one day, but it's the work of all of us making faithful decisions to make room and taking risks to embrace more, to love more, to grow more, to be stretched more. And that will never stop. Trust me, it will never stop as long as we have differences in opinions and convictions. You will learn to grow and accept even more differences. But that's what we're here for. And I pray then that we don't stop being who we are as people who belong to God, who are loved by God and speak love to God. So embracing all people is part of who we are. And I pray that we make it ours as we build our identity in God, right, to be able to see that in others first and foremost. And the last thing, right, everything else really doesn't matter. It's not an excuse for me to say I can't love you. It will never be an excuse for me to say, I love you. I only need one reason to love my neighbor as myself. Because I'm a child of God, I ought to love one another. Amen?
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're grateful, Lord God. I know we live in times where everything has just become so divisive, even based on opinions. Opinions can divide. Convictions can divide. Beliefs can divide. Not only our society, but even within your own body, Lord God. And I can't imagine how hurtful that is to you when your own children are split because of simple opinions and convictions. But Lord God, I I pray, Lord, that as we learn to accept that opinions are going to be with us. Your word doesn't tell us to get rid of these convictions and opinions, but to learn how to live with them harmoniously in agreement of the commonality that we have in you that above all of that, we still and will, will remain to be your children. So, Father, I pray that you make us different. I pray, Father, that you move us differently. I pray, Father, that you shape our views differently. That the first thing that we see, those around us, is their identity in God. And that we would honor that, that we would show mercy that we would show compassion, and that we'd be faithful, Father, to continue to embrace them. But, Father, we ask for your help with this because it's not easy. But with you, Lord God, we're able to do it. And we ask this, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.